Hi guys, today we are going to talk about proofing behaviors around distractions and more specifically proofing behaviors around distractions at home since most of us can't get out into public right now. This is one of the top questions that we've been getting since everybody's been stuck at home, since all these quarantines and shelter in places have gone into effect. We've been getting questions about socialization, questions about keeping our dogs busy, and questions about proofing around distractions, kind of as the three main topics. Now those first two, socialization slash confidence building and keeping your dog busy, those are topics that I covered in our last two Facebook Lives. So you can find those on this page. Um, I'll put the links to them in the description of this video when I get done here. So we covered those two topics already. So today we're gonna talk about this proofing around distractions. Specifically, what can we do at home to either start the proving process or keep the proving process moving. So I am sorry that I am late uh, twice in a row. I was late first and told you I'd be late and then I was late again. This is this should have been one of those days. Like if it could go wrong getting out of my house and coming to the office and setting up for this live, it did go wrong and it held me way back. But I'm here now, you're here or you're watching the replay. Either one is good and we are going to talk about some proofing. Okay. So the first thing, of course, is we want to talk really quickly about what proofing is. This is one of those words that kind of gets thrown around a lot. I think um, we all, lots of lots of us talk about proofing, but there are kind of different definitions that we work from. So first, I just want to make sure that we're all on the same page. When I use the word proofing, I mean teaching our dogs to do behaviors around distractions. Okay, so teaching my dog who already knows how to sit, for example, to sit in the presence of distractions. That is what I mean by proofing. Now, proofing is a part of a bigger picture of fluency, which is basically like being fluent in a language. If you're fluent, you can do the behavior without thinking about it much. It's not hard for you. It's easy. You can do it around the distractions and we just quickly and easily and it's the same all the time, right? So proofing is kind of a piece of that overall fluency picture. Um, stimulus control also has kind of an overlap with proofing. So stimulus control is basically teaching our dogs or making sure that the behavior is going to happen when we cue it, but not any other time. So if I say sit, my dog sits. If I say sit, he does not lay down. If I say lay down, he does not sit. You know, those kinds of things. So if you cue a behavior and your dog either doesn't do it or he does some other behavior, that's a stimulus control issue. So my point is there's a lot of overlap here with when we have fluency, we have proofing, we have stimulus control. These are all separate things of kind of the big one big picture, but today we're going to really narrow it in and we're going to talk about proofing. So proofing is, again, teaching our dogs to perform a behavior around distractions. But if you're familiar with the concepts of stimulus control or fluency, you're going to see some overlap here and that's, that's totally okay. But to go into all of those in depth would take a whole bunch of lives and so we'll do those, you know, eventually. So before we can talk about how to do proofing, right, the next question then is, when is a behavior ready for proofing? Because, oh, sorry. <laughs> One of the things that I see a lot is people trying to introduce distractions to a behavior that is not actually ready for proofing. So your behavior is, re is ready for proofing when it essentially looks the way you want it to look, has a cue, and has good stimulus control. So your dog sits, again, your dog sits when you say sit, he doesn't lay down if you say sit. Um, the sit looks the way you want it to, and you have a clean loop of behavior. So if you don't have those things, then your dog isn't really ready to proof the behavior. So we're gonna go with, um, let's go with down, because I know in one of the videos I'm gonna show you that I use, I, we're gonna proof down with one of my dogs. Um, but it doesn't matter what behavior we're talking about, right? So if I'm going to cue it down, if the down either doesn't look like I want it to look, doesn't happen when I give the cue, or takes too long to happen, can any one of these things, if the behavior isn't clean and doesn't feel finished, it's not ready for proofing, generally speaking. Okay, even if we're talking about a smaller piece of a of a behavior. And again, this could all get very complicated if we let it, or it could get very, um, we could talk about a lot of different things here if we let it in this one proofing 
proofing thing, but basically, if you are familiar with a loop, right, where we have the behavior, the re the excuse me, the behavior, the marker, the reinforcer, the behavior, the marker, the reinforcer, and we can have a cue in there, so it can go cue, behavior, marker, reinforcer. If you have a clean loop, then it's very likely that your behavior is ready for proofing. If your loop is not clean, your behavior is not ready for proofing in this moment. Now, I have videos on loopy training. I will also try to link to those in the description here. Um, so if you're not familiar with loopy training, I have videos on those that you can go back and watch. So now before we get to the actual exercises that I'm going to share with you guys today to like how to you know, do this and this and this, we want to talk a little bit about distractions. So there are some things to think about here. So first is the difficulty level of the distraction. So when I talk about the difficulty level of the distraction, the important thing here is to think about, I like to make a list, okay, a distractions list, and rate all of the distractions on that list either as, um, you know, like on a scale of 1 to 10, or easy, moderate, difficult, it doesn't really matter, but you want to rate them in some way. So for example, dog food for my retriever Kenzie is a low level distraction. You know, if I have dog food sitting on the counter, she might notice it, um, but it's going to be really easy for her. Something like a hot dog might be a more moderate level distraction. She might have a little more trouble thinking around a hot dog, right? Whereas if I have like my other retriever playing fetch over in that, you know, over there, 10 feet away, that's going to be a really high level distraction. It's going to be really, really difficult. So before you try to do proofing with your dog, it's really important that you have two lists. One is the distractions list. So all of the things that distract your dog and then rate it as like a low level distraction, a moderate level distraction, or a difficult level distraction. So a low level distraction would be something that your dog notices and then quickly can re-engage with you. So he goes, oh, I see a distraction over there. Okay, what were we doing again? That would be like a low level distraction, right? He notices it, he comes right back to you. A more moderate level distraction would be one where he sees it and he, you know, it takes a little bit more work for you to get his attention back to you. Whereas a high level distraction is going to be something that's extremely challenging. Now these are a lot of labels, we could deconstruct all of these, but I think that most of you are gonna understand what I mean by, you know, if you can think of an easy distraction for your dog or a mild distraction versus a high level distraction for your dog, right? So then you need the distractions list. You also need a reinforcement list. So you need to know what things your dog finds reinforcing and whether those are low, moderate, or high level reinforcers. So I know for Kenzie, dog food is probably a moderate level reinforcer. I know that her tennis ball is the highest level reinforcer that there is. Okay, I know with Leo, they're basically all high-level reinforcers. I'm very lucky. Leo has lots of high-level reinforcers, very few high-level distractions. I know, on the other hand, with my, with my Terrier Izzy, we have lots of low-level low uh, reinforcers, some moderate-level reinforcers, very few high-level, because she's very, the distractions tend to be higher, more difficult for her. Okay, so these are going to change based on your dog, but you need a distractions list and you need a reinforcement list because you need to know what things are low, moderate, or high level distractions for your dog. Then you also want to think about the intensity level of the distractions. Now this could be, there, these could be maybe one thing to think about, but I like to separate them out because I think about difficulty level being um, is ch are children a low level distraction that your dog barely notices or are they a high level distraction that your dog can't can't pay attention to you at all around okay but then within that distraction of children we have different intensity levels so one child sitting still on a bench is a very different distraction than three children running around playing tag Okay, so while we have the difficulty level, we also have the intensity level there. And some trainers might lump these as one, as one thing, and I think that that's fine. This is just kind of how I think about it. Because I think that when we, when we say children, we need to go deeper than that. We need to say, okay, one child sitting still, how distracting is that? Three children up and running, how distracting is that? The, so the intensity level there, if you think about a dog distraction, there's a very big difference between your dog being able to listen to you and focus around one dog who is sitting still versus two or three dogs who are barking at him. These are, these are different distractions. 
So then we also want to think about our distance from the distraction. So literally how far away from the distraction that you are. Generally speaking, the farther away you are from the distraction, the easier it's going to be. There are exceptions to this, but generally speaking, the farther away you are from the distraction, the easier it's going to be, right? And then the final one is the duration. So how long does your dog need to be in the presence of the distraction? Or how long does he have to perform the behavior in the presence of the distraction? Which one of those duration questions we're asking depends on the behavior, I think, a little bit. But generally speaking, again, the longer your dog has to be around the distraction or do the behavior in the presence of the distraction, the harder it's going to be. So we see a lot of dogs, this is really normal. For example, when we start public access, when we have kind of those novice level public access dogs, for us to have dogs who do really, really well for the first five minutes, and then after that, things start to go downhill pretty quickly. That's really normal because it takes a lot of energy to maintain behaviors and to pay attention to your handler in the presence of distractions. And the longer you're around those distractions, the more the, the more difficult it can be, right? So that is how I think about these distractions. So we have, you know, the difficulty level of the distraction, the intensity level of the distraction, the distance from the distraction, so how far away you are, and we have the duration, so how long your dog has to be in the presence of those distractions. Now, the really important thing here, the like number one thing to think about, is that you should only change one thing at a time, okay? So you are going to change either the difficulty level of the distraction or your distance from the distraction. You are not going to change two things at once. So if I'm going to use hot dogs as my distraction, and you'll see how this works in a minute, I can either, once my dog has mastered sit around the hot dog, I can either move closer to the hot dog or I can make the hot dog a more challenging distraction. I could use a higher level distraction. I am not going to do both of those things at one time. Okay, only one of those things. Now the next things, the next couple things we wanna think about before we jump into the exercises and like the how to proof the thing is the types of distractions that we have. So types of distractions include handler distractions. These are going to be um, distractions that you actually create. I'll show you these here in a minute, but it might be um, something like you doing a jumping jack, okay? And then cueing your dog to sit. That would be an example of a handler distraction. Then we have reinforcers. So these are going to be hot dogs or toys or food or something like that. Then we have things to smell. So uh, a towel with something smelly on it or the ground that smells like other dogs or just anything that your dog might want to smell. We have new places and we have people and other dogs. Just in general, these are sort of the five categories that I tend to think about distractions in. Now we could get specific and we could have other um, other categories, and maybe you're already thinking, well, you forgot this one category over here, and that's fine, okay? But in general, I tend to think about my distractions in these five categories, and I tend to move through them in this order. So I tend to start with handler distractions, then reinforcer distractions, then things to smell, and then finally new places and people and other dogs being kind of last, because those tend to be the most challenging. Handler distractions and reinforcers are things that are very easy for me to control, right? And so that's where I like to start because they're very easy for me to control. And the other thing about handler distractions, and this is where we get into a little bit of that, um, a little bit of that overlap with stimulus control, is that the handler distractions also help us make sure that our dog understand, truly understands what the cue is. So the first part of proofing, in my opinion, is really just kind of a stimulus control exercise, actually. It's just making sure that your dog understands that the, the word sit is the important piece, or the hand signal sit is the important piece. Okay, whereas me leaning forward is not important, 
or me leaning backwards is not important. These are not a part of the cue. If I have my hands in the air and I say sit, I still want my dog to sit. My hands being in the air have nothing to do with the verbal cue when I'm teaching to sit. Now with some of our behaviors, we might think that this is like not that important. We have like a sit or a down. But once you get into something like a task, do you want your dog to do the task only when you're sitting in the chair just like this? Or also when you're sitting in the chair like this? Or also when you're sitting in the chair like this? Or like this? Or like this? Okay, you see where I'm going with this? It's really important that our dogs understand the cue is the important piece. Because otherwise, everything that your dog can perceive when you do a training session can accidentally become a part of the cue. If I only ever train with this vest on, this vest could become a part of the cue so that my dogs only sit when mom is wearing the vest. Or if I only ever teach sit while I'm standing, then me being in a standing position can become a part of the cue. And if I then sit, my dogs may no longer respond to the cue, not because they're being stubborn or because they're trying to be difficult or something like that, but because they simply do not recognize the sit cue when I'm sitting. Because they have, in, they have somehow associated me standing with the sit cue. Okay, so let me pull out a video, and I had these videos all lined up, and this is one of the things that, at the beginning of this live, I said if it could go wrong, it did, and finding and keeping my videos, are, it, it, the video issue is one of the things that went wrong, okay, today. So, I have to refine my video super quick, but the first one that we're going to talk about is the handler distractions. So handler distractions really are as kind of what it sounds like. You're going, you're going to make a distraction and then cue the behavior. Okay, let me find it because I have it. Okay, hold on. Is this it? Hold on. Aha, okay, this is it. Okay, so this video will work. It's not the video I had in mind, but it shows the exact same concept, so it's all fine. Okay, so this video is Leo and I working on handler distractions with a down. So I'm gonna jump ahead, and because I think in the beginning it's mostly just me talking. And what I'm gonna do is first, you need to warm up the cue that you wanna practice. I'm just getting to the part that I want you guys to see. Okay, here we go. So I'm going to just make different handler distractions and cue my behavior. I think. So you can see, down, when I change my body enough, he does get a little bit confused. And I am talking in the video. Down. So it really is just me asking for the cue or asking for the down behavior while I am in different positions. Now the reason, just really quick for anybody wondering, the reason that I am reinforcing him for laying down multiple times on the ground is because he was having an issue where he was jumping up. I would say down, he would do the down, and then after the click he was jumping up and I wanted to change that. So I'm reinforcing him multiple times for laying down, but that's not, a, that's not the important piece here. Just, just this little side note. I'm pulling out my, my uh, master yoga skills here. Good. So these are examples of handler distractions. This is, okay, there you go. This, these are examples of handler distractions. And I like to start here. And how you do handler distractions is going to be different. But start making sure you do them while you're standing, while you're sitting. Do you need your dog to respond to cues when you're sitting on the floor, when you're laying down, when you are using certain pieces of adaptive equipment? Um, these are just different types of handler distractions that we want to make sure that our dogs are still responding to the cue even though we're doing those kind of weird things, right? Now, the next one that I like to do is reinforcers as distractions because again, 
Reinforcers are something that I can control. So reinforcers, dog food, dog treats, hot dogs, leftover steak, a tennis ball, a tug toy, whatever. It depends on your dog and what he finds. Again, this is why you have to have that list. What things does your find, dog find as to be mild distractions versus difficult distractions, right? So this is going to be food as a distraction. And here, so there's a couple things to watch for, okay, first, before I push play. So I have my distractions. I'm just using dog food in this video. And before I ask for the behavior that I want to proof, which in this video is healing, I need to warm up around this distraction first. So in our academy, I teach about barometer behaviors. It's one of my favorite lessons that I have inside the academy because um, barometer behaviors are important for proofing both in your home like this as well as once we get out into public. A, I call them barometer behaviors. I'd already started calling them that after I heard other trainers just call them warm-up exercises or baseline behaviors or baseline routines or anything like that. But the point of them is that if I do something like a hand target and I know how my dog does a hand target at home, I can compare that performance with the performance I am getting now, and that will tell me all kinds of things about how distracted my dog is, how nervous he is, his mental state, all of these things, right? So what you're going to see in this video is before I go to the healing, which I, I think is what I'm proofing in this video if I have the right video in my head, is that first I'm going to do some of my attention loop where I'm just clicking for eye contact and then reinforcing him. And then once I have a clean loop there, then I move into the behavior that I want to prove. Because with my dogs and how I teach inside the academy, and I think that this is really valuable, is that if our dogs can't even do their barometer behaviors around the distractions, they almost definitely cannot do the behavior that you are wanting to proof around the distractions. Okay? And it is a good warm-up. It allows you to... Um, Assess kind of how difficult is this distraction? Do you need to move farther away from the distraction? This kind of thing. Okay, so I'm going to push play. Okay, so first here, I am just going to mark and reinforce him for looking up at me. And the position that he's in is not important to me in this moment. I'm just marking and reinforcing that sort of eye contact, that him looking up at me. And then we're going to do a couple of hand targets. And when I have my nice clean loop, which I do, then I can cue the behavior I want to prove which is getting into heel position and then walking in the heel position. So now we can practice the healing around the food with the bonus distraction of the cat, who I then lock out of the room and try again. So here is where, so Drake, the dog in this video, did really well with the food on the table. So let me pause it for a second. He did really well with the food on the table. So he's ready for me to change something. But I only want to change one thing. So I could either make the dog food a more difficult distraction, like a hot dog, or I can move the distraction closer to him. I do not do both of those things at one time. So what I have done in this video is take the dog food from the table to the chair. So now it's more at nose level. That increases my difficulty. But I left it as dog food. I didn't also change it to something more challenging. So again, I go back to my barometer behaviors, getting a couple of attention loops in here before I work on healing. And then we do our heel. I use the word close to swing into heel position, and then we heel right past the food. And then again, when he's successful again, I have the same choice. Do I want to use a harder distraction or do I want to make the distraction closer or do I want to use a new distraction altogether? These types of things. So I really like reinforcer distractions because like I said, they're very controllable and you actually have a lot of options with them. Okay. So I like to start with dog food and then I might use dog treats and then I might use um, like human crackers and then I might use hot dogs and then I, you know. And I can get up to, like, leftover steak. You know, and if I have leftover steak sitting on the floor, that's a pretty high-level distraction for most of the dogs on the planet, right? Not all. There are some dogs who don't care about leftover steak. But most dogs really do. And it is that's a really challenging distraction. That's something that you can work up to right in your own home. You don't have to go anywhere for that, right? So 
Then we can work up to if your dog is really toy motivated. You can work up to toys. If you have kids in your home, you can have them help you. Th those types of things. So I'm going to see if I can find one more video to show you. And um, look, I look in the right place if I want to find the video. So I want to show one more video to you guys of proofing um, the dog bed behavior. So again, I'm going to jump ahead a little bit. So, okay, so this is Kenzie. This is one of my um, duck tolling retrievers, and she's on the dog bed. And this is a proofing session that I did with her for our academy members um, a couple of weeks ago. And I'm going to start, I think I start with food distractions. Let me back up. Okay, we'll just push play. We'll just push play, we'll see how it goes. So she's on her bed. And you can see... You know, you know, not, not only, only is Kenzie at a There you go, I start with human level, distractions. She's also a, um, a very different dog. She's a very different personality. Than Leo, who in the academy I, sh I showed this session with two dogs. Um, and Leo is a much so then what different I'm gonna dog. So is some reinforcer distractions. So you see she got down. Okay, we're going to actually try it over here so you guys can see better. Let's start over so you guys can see a little better. I'm going to take the, I have some treats in my hand. I put them on the ground. You, you may, may have, have already seen, seen this exercise, exercise in the academy. academy. Very good. But this, but this is, is basically, basically where we're going to kind of combine Susan Garrett's, Garrett's It's Your Choice game with um, staying, staying on the dog, dog bed. bed. So, so what, what I'm, I'm using, using is, is sort of these... Um, I'm, I'm using, using the reinforcements, reinforcements which is just dog food right, right now, as a distraction. And I'm going to go ahead and throw the clicker back in there to help Kenzie really understand what it is that I, that I want, want her to do. And, and if, if she gets, she gets down, down, all I'm gonna, I'm gonna do is cover, cover the treats with my hand, hand um, just, just like, like I would do during you know, the It's Your Choice game. game. And, and what, what you, you could, could also do, if, if your, your dog, dog knows the pre-match pre cue, is you could certainly use um, a bowl of treats instead of treats on the ground. So I'm kind of throwing the treats around, you know, that time I think three. So this is just an example of using, um, so first you saw handler distractions where I sort of spun in a circle. I could do jumping jacks. I could, I seriously, you guys, I sometimes proof behaviors while I do my morning workout. So I will do yoga and ask my dogs for behaviors and toss the treats. Or I will do, um, like just whatever workout I'm doing that morning. I literally use that as a time to train my dogs Some uh, sometimes. Um, because I'm doing all kinds of weird things, right? If I'm doing yoga, I'm in all kinds of positions. If I'm doing squats, I'm moving a whole bunch. If I'm doing jumping jacks or whatever it is, um, I use my workouts as a time to practice uh, handler distractions. So you saw handler distractions first, and then you saw these are, this is a food reinforcer. So I have food on the ground. I'm using Susan Garrett's It's Your Choice game, which I love. You can find that on um, YouTube. I'm just going to move ahead. Okay, and then I get some toys out. Now, toys and movement is much more challenging for Kenzie. Now, your dog, if your dog doesn't care about toys, but he's a food maniac, then you might start with toys and then go to food. But for Kenzie, I know that food is easier. So I'm going to start with food and then move into the toys. Again, this is why the distraction list is so important. It's imperative for you to know which things your dog finds distracting and how distracting. So you can start with lower level distractions and move your way into higher level distractions. So we always want to start lower. We want to set our dogs up to succeed. And then and just, just some, some sort of calm movements, movements with, with the, the toy. toy. So I start with little movements because if I just go to throwing the, throwing the toy, this dog is going to fail. So I start with little movements and then I slowly, oops, oh no. And then I slowly make it harder. Reinforce everybody here. Or, or dropping, dropping it. it. Wow, those are some bad mechanics, you guys. I'm clicking and reaching into my treat pouch at the same time. You don't want to do that. So you've heard me talk about this before if you've been around a while. Clean mechanics are really important. You want to mark, pause, and then deliver a treat. So what I was doing just there where I was marking, like I think I even had my hand in my treat pouch before I marked, that's like really sloppy training. And Kenzie's letting me get away with it because she's a more advanced dog, but it is 
sloppy training and it is not what I recommend. I recommend clean training, which would be mark, so click in my case, pause, then reach your, my hand into my tree pouch for the treat. So that was some very sloppy training there. Yikes. Other but it happens to all of us. And so now I'm and just and making and the toys harder and harder. Those, those, you can see Kenton's really doing pretty well, well with me just dropping the toys and just, and just moving, moving them around. Them around. But if, but if I, start I start to make, to make the, toys the toys more exciting, exciting that's, that's where, where she's, she's gonna, gonna, it's, it's gonna, gonna be harder, harder for her. And so, so if you, you can, can see, see her, her ear, ear set, set has, has changed, changed her, tail her tail is wagging, wagging faster, faster. You, can you can see that this is a little, little bit harder, harder for her. I think there's a squeaker in here, but maybe not. Okay, so you guys get the idea. So then you go from there, you know, all the way into throwing toys. So, so for example, I know, because I know Kenzie's distractions and reinforcer lists, I know if Kenzie could stay on her dog bed while I throw a tennis ball, she can stay on her dog bed around anything. Because that is the hardest level distraction that there is, okay? Or I should say it will be easy, very easy to introduce other distractions because I know that the tennis ball is the hardest one that there is. So these are a couple of my favorites, okay, that I just showed you. So starting with handler distractions, then we move into, um, let's go through our list again, right? So we start with handler distractions. So this, you saw this in the video, me like putting my hands in the air and then cueing the down, something like that. Then we have reinforcers, so food, toys, start low, make it more challenging. Then we have things to smell. Now, I don't have a video of this, but you can do this at home. You can, uh, there we go. What button am I looking for? <laughs> got I got distracted there by all the buttons on my screen. Um, you can do things to smell at home with a little bit of creativity. So you can do, like, you can take a towel and you can rub it on something smelly. So, like, for example, my horses live at my house, so I could go, like, take a towel and, like, rub it on my horses and then bring the towel inside and use that as a distraction. Um, I used, if you have, like, an empty can of, of, like, wet dog food, that could be a smelly distraction. Of course, be careful. You don't want your dog, like, trying to chew on that. That could be unsafe. But a little bit of creativity and you can actually find things to smell as distractions in your own home. And then you just go about it exactly like you already saw in this video. So things to smell, um, new places. Now this is one that, you know, you may not be able to do much of right now because we're not all able to get out, okay? But two things about new places as far as distractions. First, um, new places in your home are actually really valuable. So I don't know about you guys, but I don't train my dogs in my bathroom. I just don't. So going into my bathroom for a training session would be an, an example of a new place. Now, hopefully it's not very challenging or maybe it's not very challenging. It's not definitely not as challenging as like the mall, but it is a new place and it's also a new surface. Um, putting my dogs up on my bed and then doing a training session, that would be a new place. I don't I don't ask them for behaviors on my bed, except for maybe like lay down or get off, right? Those are the only two things. So those are new places. But also one of the big things I see owner trainers underestimate is the value of new outdoor locations. So we're so quick to get into public that we skip training in parking lots and training in parks and training in all of those kinds of different locations. So depending on where you live right now and the rules that are happening where you live, because everybody's shelter in place order is a little bit different or the quarantine, depending on the country that you're in or even the state that you're in, if you're in the United States where I live, then the rules right now are a little bit different for everybody. But if you are allowed to leave your home, you're just not allowed, like, but businesses are closed down, parking lots are great. Um, the park down the road is great. Um, anything like that, those are new locations and those count. Okay, those are great training. So, and, and also, for example, like I know, um, like our Walmart is really busy always right now. So if I went to the other end of the Walmart parking lot, I wouldn't come into contact with anybody. 
but we could still train in a new place around quite a bit of commotion. But it depends, like I said, it depends on the rules where you live because everybody's, everybody's shelter in place order, even within the United States, is very different. Um, so there are some options for new places. Okay. And then um, people and dogs as our last distraction. Now, this is going to be one that is going to be much harder for most of us to be doing right now. Um, again, depending on the rules where you are, you know, you could call up a friend and have them meet you at a park and you guys can just stay 20 or 30 feet away from each other and you can train your dog while they produce distractions for you. Same thing if you have a friend with a dog. You know, if you can meet at a parking lot somewhere and stay 30 feet away from each other and do your training session that way, that would be a really great way to work around distractions. And actually, excuse me, that is how you should be introducing people and dog distractions. So if you either haven't introduced those distractions yet, or your dog is really struggling with those, calling up a friend who will follow your instructions and also stay 30 feet away from you is how you want to be doing these sessions. Because remember, those whole, those whole things to think about, right, where I said you can only change one thing at a time, the difficulty level, the intensity level, the distance, or the duration, distance there is really important. So starting your dog 30 feet away from your friend who's creating distractions for you is actually ideal. That's actually how we want to be doing this. So one of the things that I am seeing right now is that this virus is actually forcing a lot of us to train the way we should be training and not skip this and not skip steps because it's very easy for us to, um, you know, train something at home and then just go to the mall and practice it there. But, and while that does work for some dogs, that skips a lot of steps. And so one of the things that I'm seeing is that this virus is actually forcing a lot of trainers to take a step back and to train in the proper order and to put more thought into their training. Okay, so um, I have just a couple minutes because then I have to get into my academy group and do a Q&A in there. So I have just a couple minutes. If we have any questions, I can answer just one or just a few of them. Um, and then I have to go because I've got to be live um, for my academy members. So TJ said, is rain one too, right? So like as a distraction. So some dogs are absolutely going to need practice in rain. So actually, I see this distraction come up a lot, where, or problem come up a lot, where dogs, they respond great to cues inside, outside, all the time until it's, until it's raining. And then we have to go through, you know, rain is something we need to proof our service dogs on. So I actually do take my service dogs outside when it's raining, first just to play. So like the last time it rained here this week, Leo and I went outside just to play fetch in the rain, just to help make the rain um, a more like comfortable, happy sort of experience. And then the next time it rains, we'll probably go outside and do an actual training session. If it's not too cold, because sometimes in the spring we get really cold rain here in Wisconsin. And I am not, um, I am, I'm not a cold rain sort of person. Okay. Um, so TJ has a, mentioned wearing different hats um, works as a distraction for hope. So masks and hats are a really great um, a really great handler distraction. So if we can cover our face or put different things on our heads, even something like, like I will put a dog bowl on top of my head sometimes just to change things, to teach our dogs that, you know, the idea that, that our, our profile changes can be hard for our dogs. We want to train our service dogs through that. So different glasses, different masks, different hats. These are great. Um, so TJ says, how can we get her past her fear of the mask? So TJ, there's a whole assignment or there's a whole lesson inside the Academy on this. Um, it's in stage two on, I think it's just like wearing masks or hats. I don't remember the name of the lesson, but there is a lesson very specifically on working with masks and hats, but quickly for anybody else. So TJ, you want to look that up, but for anybody else, um, I like to introduce masks first, not on anybody. I just let my dog sniff it. I might even reinforce them for interacting with it. Then I'm going to hold it up to my face and feed my dog a few times just for free. Like, look, I'm wearing a mask. Here, have a few treats. And then I'm going to wear the mask and cue a really easy behavior, mark and reinforce, you know, a very high rate of reinforcement, essentially. I want very easy behavior. So you start with your barometer behaviors and work up. Um, and then... Um, 
And then from there, I might have other people wearing the mask. But I always like to start it on me so that my dogs can, can see it on me first. Okay. Yeah, so Rebecca says, funky clothes throws us right off now. Big puffy coats, large hats, all of that stuff. That stuff is all great, great proofing. Um, and your service dog's not only proofing for you so that your dog will listen to you, but also because you are going to come across in public people wearing all kinds of hats and headdresses and masks and glasses and all kinds of things. And we want our dogs very well desensitized to that. Um, okay. So then Harley says, um, for the people and dog distraction, we have been using YouTube videos of dogs barking. Would that work if you were completely stuck inside? That is going to be helpful. That is going to be a great step. So this is something I think I recommended to my academy members the other day, um, is that playing YouTube sounds of the things, and actually I talked about it in um, the socialization live I did a few weeks ago, um, to expose our dogs and desensitize them to things that we can't get out and do right now, YouTube, like videos on YouTube can be really helpful. So the good thing about dogs barking is that you can completely get over that piece of the distraction. You still will have to do all of your training around the sight of other dogs, but you can at least be working on the sound of other dogs. And you guys can be doing the same thing with crowd noises, sirens, fireworks, all of that kind of stuff. Okay. And then Cindy says, so I would assume we would want to have it be a friend whose dog doesn't react to other dogs first. Yes. So I should have clarified that. So if you were going to call up a friend and have them be the dog distraction for you, it absolutely must be a dog who will not bark at your dog in the beginning. Because until our dogs are great around other dogs, so that's that intensity level, right? We want to start with a low intensity, which is one well-behaved dog and then slowly work up to dogs who are barking or, or doing something like that. Um, so yeah, you absolutely want to start with one well-behaved dog and then work your way up. Okay, cool. Well, that is it for today. I've got to get over to my other, um, my other group. So I will be live again next week. Let us know if you guys have any questions inside of our Facebook group. Train Your Service Dog with Confidence is the best place to ask them. Um, if you found this video helpful, I'd love it if you'd hit the like button and then share it anywhere that other owner trainers uh, might also find it helpful. And I will see you guys next week. Have a good day.